Dear viewers, thank you for joining us. I am Adisa Safa. You are watching OB and Horn of Africa. This is Talk to OB and Show. Today, I joined by Professor Anna Fitz. She is a professor of international security who has researched, written, and published journals on the issue of Ethiopia so many times. Professor Anna, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Most Western countries have been standing against Pan-African movements for four years, and they still do not want to see an African leader who promotes this grand continental agenda. What is the secret behind, Professor? Um, in answer to the question, I don't think that there's any big secret behind this. Indeed, believing that there was a big secret behind this would be giving uh, political offices like the Biden administration too much credit, I think. The fact of the matter is that Africa is on the rise, is doing some great things. It still has barriers to its development, but has had a real injection of global private sector support to assist in the innovation. Innovation that comes with less bureaucracy than we see in more developed countries at times. So arguably there's scope for economic pivoting to work faster in Africa's favor. And Africa has also seen the rise of higher, its higher education institutions and therefore a rise of its middle class. It's welcomed members of its diaspora back to the continent, either in part-time or full-time capacities. And it's enhanced the commitment from the diaspora all around. And lastly, we shouldn't underestimate the role played by cultural norms and values in Africa. African countries are much more communitarian in nature than northern developed countries, uh, where the focus is on quality of outcome rather than quality of opportunity. So in my view, we shouldn't underestimate how Africans continentally are beginning to see the difference in outcomes between collective longer term thinking and individualistic short-term geopolitical thinking. And importantly, the way that these positions are have become laced with hypocrisy when the very donor countries uh, project commitments towards anti-oppression and equity is inviting quite a response from um, African, Africans outside of the continent. How do Africans emancipate themselves from Western mental slavery? How long do African nations get governed by puppet leaders assigned by the West? I think there's a number of ways that Africans can um, raise the bar on these issues to project uh, more self-sufficient strategic leadership. Uh, where we have not seen some strength, admittedly, on different parts of the continent, including the Horn of Africa region, is uh, both in terms of strategic and collective thinking. Um, uh, I shouldn't say collective thinking, collective interests, the articulation of collective interests. Even in regional peacekeeping deployments, we've seen at times the national interest of contributing countries take precedent because of a lack of articulated regional security issues. Uh, so I don't think the African Union has done as much as it could possibly do to define collective interests and really explain what they mean to the African population, so too must uh, collective interests be well articulated at the national level. Um, and when there is a firm and widespread understanding of these interests and how national policies support these interests, this enhances societal cohesion and unity, and therefore a country's resilience. I would say secondly, that to use these national and collective interests to generate decent and effective policies and strategies. In the past, not just African countries, but countries in, in the Northern hemisphere as well, um, have, have not been particularly strong on this front. Uh, African countries have been dependent on Western aid uh, a great deal in the past. And in many cases, there has been a lack of nonpartisan adjudication of these offers of support. And often offers of support are uh, largely supply driven um, as opposed to, to a lesser extent, being demand driven approaches on what precisely is, is a good and uh, well-timed in terms of support for a particular country. 
Um, but the resilience that a country can galvanize around uh, is often, uh, often depends on a well thought out national strategy, a reliable strategy with the necessary policies to support it and support a strategic direction for the country. It gives the country the wherewithal to say, um, this is our strategy and this is how you as a supporting country and a partner for us can help us. So thirdly, I would say that African countries need to preside with equivalency. Uh, don't be treated as anything less than equal players at the global table and at the global, within the global community of states. For example, if the likes of um, Secretary of State Blinken or a national security advisor like Jake Sullivan reaches out for discussions with uh, Ethiopia, unite them with their counterpart in Ethiopia. That's how diplomacy normally works. Of course, if President Biden was visiting the country, um, he would have direct interactions with Prime Minister uh, Abiy Ahmed at the moment, but whatever Prime Minister is in office. Um, and otherwise, even for special envoys, there are counterparts for these roles. So preside at the global table with equivalency. Um, I would say, Third, lastly, uh, the dire experience that Ethiopia has had recently with the international media, not all media outlets, but most of the major media outlets, uh, which have failed in carrying out their responsibilities in upholding investigative journalism, should make the continent raise its bar on developing their own media outlets and starting to exercise real discretion over what should and should not be consumed based on how well this works for the progress of the continent. Um, in many respects, Africa has been let down by the media and it's horrific that powerful lobby groups facilitate closer relationships between criminal elements and global powers. It's horrific that major media outlets like CNN can be paid by allegedly um, criminal groups to take staged video footage, which profiles um, staged and lopsided accounts from the ground. Um, yeah, unethical and unacceptable. And Africa has some great television stations and local reporters. So my advice would be to empower them, support them, develop all aspects of them, their governance structures, their good practice, their representativity and their outreach. The current prime minister of Ethiopia is known for promoting a regional and a continental integrity among African nations, which pretty goes in line with the ideals of Pan-Africanism. But several Westerners do not seem to be comfortable with this move and uh, are even intervening in internal matters of Ethiopia. They are supporting TPLF, Tigray, Liberation Front, which ruled Ethiopia with iron fist for 27 years and was finally ousted by popular uprising three years ago. Why do they still support TPLF, Professor? It's easy to understand why there is a perception that some international community leaders, perhaps like the US and the EU, are indeed supporting the TPLF directly and indirectly. Um, I would say that the US is even getting involved in meddling with Ethiopia's internal borders, which effectively gives insurgents political cover to reject a ceasefire and continue aggression to give the false impression that they are capturing areas liberated from rebel illegal op occupation. And this kind of meddling only serves to destabilize an entire region. And there's been some research on the ground in Tigray, which has engaged with the management of aid organizations and aid agencies, and reported some fairly horrific stories of agencies like USAID and UNICEF uh, purposely blocking any progress for schools and the writing of national exams for students who are ready and able to write them and who have access to the, the buildings that are there to write these exams in. Um, and there are education and food security and nutrition advisors who 
have been in Tigray working on the ground since before the, the conflict, in some cases long before the conflict. Some of these advisors will tell you details of how maligning behavior has been at play. Um, and you don't see the normal slate of media commentators rushing to uh, have a take on these issues and other stories which um, weaken, or even in some cases risk falsifying the positions they've taken. Even this week, we saw an international reporter totally misquote from the prime minister's speech, um, which you know, has made members of uh, certainly the scholarly community that, that uh, I'm familiar with uh, better understand perhaps why the Ethiopian government may have asked this reporter to, to leave the country in the first place. So they don't take up these stories seriously because it undermines the position that have been taken by major media agencies. And I would say that newspapers and, and media agencies should not take positions, hard positions. Um, that is for opinion pieces and that is for uh, analysis, usually presented by uh, either guests of the newspapers or those very skilled to do it. Um, the media should be reporting the facts on the ground, reporting a diversity of perspectives. That's why we um, support uh, media as a responsible member of civil society. While Ethiopia is striving to promote African integration in all fronts, why other African countries are not sufficiently supporting this move? I would say for the same reasons that I said earlier, the issue concerns um, collectivism and moves to provide collective responses to security issues, collective responses to economic challenges, and I would say don't underestimate how African countries and friends and neighbors of Ethiopia are watching the sort of geopolitics that are playing out on the GERD at the moment. Um, you know, wondering if the same sort of palava and geopolitics would uh, befall on them should they make similar attempts to encourage regionalism and collective responses. So, yeah, I would, I would say that uh, big issues like this need to be promoted from the top, and the top for Africa is the African Union. So defining collective security interests and then letting those interests trickle down on the regional organizations that should map out some strategic direction for the regions, and then have the nations in each region come together and decide on you know, not just ideas on how to pursue these collective interests, but make plans, implementable plans to do so. Uh, why the U.S. tied a knot with the rebel TPLF while it constantly downgrading efforts by the new leadership to democratize Ethiopia? Well, I think this is the million dollar question on the table out there for, for many analysts and, and the world that is watching events in Ethiopia. I think the answer is multifaceted, but to, and, and some of my writing has explained the linkages between US national security direction, which has uh, a lot to do with its economic direction and the access that it would like to have to the resources that it needs to have to, um, to map out a pathway in this direction. But I think also the elephant in the room is uh, the way in which a very privileged social structure developed over 30 years has been transplanted into the international community as well. And the fact that um, there has been one party with the same leaders that has ruled the country for um, just short of 30 years. And Actually, if you look at the 30 years and the people that have held positions, there hasn't been a lot of churn, the kind of churn that you would expect over, over 27 years. Um, and you know, when, when people stay in office for that long, there are many embedded relationships that develop. And you know, even with friendships that we all have, embedded relationships sometimes bring uh, no matter what philosophies and governance ideologies underpin these relationships, 
friendships can come with a sense of obligation. Um, and I think there are signs that we're, we're seeing it here in terms of some of the relationships that have emerged with, um, with the TPLF as a party, with, with some TPLF actors. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we're not in the businesses we're in as professionals to tout the narratives of our friends. It's our responsibility to gather facts and analyze the truth. And we see uh, people standing beside this truth in some ways, but we see others standing beside uh, other narratives, possibly because of, of the friends and relationships that have been made for, for so long with the same individuals. Um, but when even friends commit crimes, it's equally unacceptable not to speak out about them. We also know how much money sits behind this, this um, phenomenon and you know, what, what many are describing as a pursuit of power. Money that can buy powerful lobbyists, money that can buy lawyers to write letters to, to employers and boards to have people dismissed from their jobs and, and um, money that can buy congressional members for their midterm election votes. So, you know, we're seeing a very dark hour at the moment in terms of geopolitics in the Horn of Africa, in uh, terms of geopolitical relationships with non-state actors. The TPLF junta had uh, heinously attacked the Northern Command of the National Defense Force of Ethiopia last November. Uh, and the federal government had carried out a law enforcement measure, as it was uh, learned. And recently, the central government has declared a unilateral ceasefire, but TPLF is acting as if it took upper hand over the National Defense Force. Does this sound to you? Uh, yes, I think, I think you're that assertion is correct, but this shouldn't be surprising to anyone. This is a classic insurgency tactic to distort any form of space or ground given by an opponent and to create a narrative from this which makes your opponent look weak or appear weak. The very strange thing is that these narratives are being projected even when the Ethiopian National Defense Forces are not in the areas that the TPLF is so-called uh, liberating. Um, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces appeared to have won the conventional war in Tigray very quickly, um, but based on a combination of guerrilla tactics and um, based on this intelligence structure in the region that has become since 2005 known as a one in five structure, as well as the relatively authoritarian rule that the region has hosted so long, the ENDF was not going to win the counterinsurgency effort without the risk of civilian casualties. Because um, by, by transplanting guerrilla tactics across communities, civilians become used as shields for the insurgents. So I feel that uh, the government's decision to withdraw was a very wise move. After the Ethiopian army left the Tigray region weeks ago, TPLF has organized its force, including teenagers and waged war on the neighboring Amhara regional state in the name of reclaiming uh, seized territories. Though so several global media are exposing the fact that TPLF is using children for military operation. No Western country has so far dared to blame the TPLF group for such heinous war crime on children. Why? This is, uh, this is horrific and it is absolutely unacceptable uh, and demonstrates that in some parts of the international community, uh, it is appearing willing to further compromise the rules-based order, the very rules-based order that it is that it promulgates and which it is blaming countries like China for breaking. 
horrendous to see the images coming out of the region um, of how children are being recruited into these roles, uh, roles that constitute a war crime and a crime against humanity. These children should be in school. They should be given the lives that they deserve, um, which they can have access to in Ethiopia. And I don't think this issue will be forgotten in Ethiopia and the region, not, not by the world either. And I'm sure lots of other uh, African partners of Ethiopia are looking on this with great concern. Um, and and it, 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 it's uh, also shocking that we have not seen global leaders take the stage and speak out about this. Um, and to some extent, it, it would be such a shift from the position that some of those leaders have created that um, it, would, it would undermine those positions. The big question I think is who will be the first to speak out? Um, besides a small number of academicians and analysts who still have, uh, who are still demonstrating threads of morality, ethics and principles, who will that country be? Which G7 country will speak out about this issue of child soldiering? Um, and there's more geopolitics at play here. We recently saw both the G7 summit and a NATO meeting in, in Brussels take place, which brought global powers together. Some of these middle powers um, will be hoping to rekindle their relationship with the new Biden-led America, uh, particularly for post-COVID economic pivoting purposes. And they may, as a result, be reticent to speak out and fall out of line with the US. Concerning the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam, Egypt, Sudan are still sticking to the colonial era treaty that deny Ethiopia any share of Nile water despite its contribution of over 85 plus percent of the water via Blue Nile. The two countries even took the matter to the United Nations Security Council last week, refusing any attempts the African Union is making to negotiate the three countries over the issue, why Egypt and Sudan refuse to believe in Africa's capacity of solving its problem by its own. Thank you for that question. I think the, the timing of it is very important right now, especially as we, we saw the UN Security Council sit last week to discuss it. And because the issue seems to be still on the table in the UN um, because of the proposal that Tunisia is trying to push forward with. So I would say that we know that most of the agenda concerning the GERD is being driven by Egypt um, with, to a large extent, US support. Sudan, uh, in my view, appears to be um, quite confused in its position. Even in its address in last week's Security Council meeting, I, I, I detected a lot of um, disclarity in some of its messages. And, and this is no surprise. Sudan is a country that has had a very decent relationship with Ethiopia in the past, whose parliament gave Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed a standing ovation for brokering a uh, peaceful political transitional governance arrangement in um, uh, the, the, the following the fall of the al-Bashir government, um, and a country which would stand to benefit hugely from the GERD, not only in having Blue Nile waters without so much sediment inside, which gives it the name of, of the Brown Nile, uh, and which makes flooding so much worse, but by benefiting from the dam's strong capacity to capitalize on the 12% of water, which gets lost at the moment to evaporation, also to immediately benefit from having three times the amount of water that it has at the moment um, uh, to, to benefit for its agricultural productivity uh, and therefore the food security of the country. And the Sudanese water minister used similar words only last year, I think, um, uh, on this issue. So Sudan's sort of 360 turn on the issue and its accusations of Ethiopia's belligerence is quite odd, I think, and misplaced. I would argue that this mostly concerns Egypt, um, the Sudanese armed forces, 
uh, which are attracted to the idea of military modernization, the funding that Egypt uh, is giving and support to, is giving to Sudan for this modernization, funding which is effectively uh, being given to Egypt by the United States and which is being funneled into Egypt at the moment like a big, uh, a large pipe. Uh, and lastly, the fact that Egypt sees the Arab League as its go-to regional actor and less the African Union for its purposes. And I think this is where the African Union must step up to the plate and remind the world who the continental authority on Africa is and support its member states. Professor Anna, okay. Uh, on the platform organized by Security Council to discuss GERD issue. Several Africans, several African representatives in attendance, including those from Kenya, uh, have opposed the UN's interference on the subject totally out of jurisdiction and recommended African Union led negotiation among the three countries. How do you see such stand from fellow African countries to address African issue by Africans? why Egypt counts trust on the US and African Union? I think that Egypt will continue to capitalize on having the United States in its pockets until the world speaks out against the impact of, of this activity. And it's movements like the, the Black Alliance that, that we're, we're starting to hear a lot from uh, on current geopolitics in the Horn of Africa and sub-Saharan African countries within the African Union, which need to come together, expose hypocrisy where it should be exposed, and also to raise the fact that years worth of donor efforts to support institutional the, the institutional development of the African Union of prioritizing, prioritizing African solutions to African problems, of uh, supporting the sustainable de development goals. I mean, if, if um, let's just take the GERD issue, for example, if the development of the GERD is impeded, sustainable development goals for Ethiopia and the Horn of African countries will be really impacted by this. You know, there's, it, it's sort of a, a network pathology the way in which um, an enabler like the GERD, if impacted, would have on uh, many of the different sustainable development goals. So um, these are the kinds of agendas that these geopolitical actions now risk totally unraveling. Actions that would set Africa, particularly the Horn of Africa, back in years and undermine progress today. Egypt wanted the US and World Bank to directly participate in the GERD negotiation from day one, but that move failed and the UN Security Council decided that the negotiation sh should be continued under African Union. Do you think that African Union would efficiently manage this GERD issue? And how do you see this from the perspective of addressing African problems using African wisdom? You have many questions for me today, but I'm very happy to answer them. Um, I absolutely do. I, I do believe in the capacity of the African Union to respond to issues like this and to facilitate progress in them. I had the privilege of working uh, in support of a number of peace processes um, in Africa and elsewhere in the world. Comparatively, African leaders bring um, real skill dialogue mediation skills, a sense of collective outcome to these processes. We have heard increasing and encouraging signs of leadership um, within the Security Council in, in, in the UN, even particularly on the part of Kenya. But more African leaders need to rise up, I think, and, and come on board in support of African institutional leadership. The continent must stand together and stand united Failure to um, do so might take these events in a different direction and may set a worrying precedent for uh, other countries to become the target of what um, are appearing to be short-term proxy interests. All right. Ethiopian calls their vote a month ago and Prime Minister Abiy's party won the election in landslide. 
and the election was very free and fair as witnessed by observers and contesting political parties. This would create conducive environment to democratize the country. But the Westerners have still chosen to stand beside the rebuilt PLF. What do you think about this? Yes, I think it's disappointing that those actors who are speaking out about Ethiopia at the moment could not, in some cases, lift themselves to congratulating the country on its relatively successful elections. And I say relatively successful because everything is relative and where we've come from in the past in Ethiopia, uh, it was a significant step forward. Even I think the region that I think you're speaking to me from at the moment, uh, Romia, um, I think I'm correct in saying approximately 18 million people out of the 20 million eligible to vote, voted, which is a very high percentage of registration and voting. And uh, so um, I think when people did speak out on the elections, some also felt the need to include statements which referred to some election rigging, uh, when, there, when there was no grounds for this, there was no evidence to show that election rigging took place at all. In fact, the reports coming out from the independent observers said it was very peaceful, it was transparent, um, and it offered its congratulations to the country. And uh, I can only imagine that a, a huge amount of work was put in place amidst a conflict in the North, amidst other pressures that the country was coming under at the time to, to orchestrate the election from the beginning. Okay, it wasn't a perfect election, but you know, I'm talking to you from Canada at the moment and we don't need to look too far south of our Canadian border to uh, observe election turmoil elsewhere in the world and election aftermath turmoil. But congratulating the, the country and the government and the prime minister would have also undermined the narrative and the positions that certain international actors have established uh, and which I spoke about earlier. So what Ethiopia got at best was uh, were lackluster messages expressing relief that the elections went peacefully, but in all cases, there was a big but afterwards with with add-ons there was no there were no unconditional notes of uh well, very few that i saw unconditional notes of congratulations ethiopian prime minister has gained a warm appreciation from different stakes in reforming the country but the u.s and some european countries turned blind eyes to all those grand initiatives undergone by the new leadership what is your view on this yeah it was surprising how much support uh, the Prime Minister attracted during the first two years of his leadership and, and for the reforms as well, even for individual reforms, um, people were speaking around the world were speaking very positively about uh, them, supportively about them. Uh, but then after the TPLF group became very aggravated uh, and um, initiated messaging to the international community, um, we saw violence uh, that was orchestrated um, and minds started to change towards Abbey uh, based on the perception that um, the government wasn't handling this violence and instability as well as it could do. Um, instead of asking exactly what is happening here to orchestrate this violence, equally I would um, also suggest that the government has not been particularly strong in presenting clear messages to explain the grounds for a number of its decisions, such as detaining people, um, uh, some political actors, such as, um, uh, uh, well, managing conflicts in, in different areas the way it has done. And I think, you know, there's often a fine line between how much information um, a government should disclose to the wider international community and to its population to explain why it's taking a certain strategic direction and information that might be 
better left undisclosed for purposes of national security. Look, my view on this is that both national actors and media are operating a little bit to a certain extent on the basis of groupthink at the moment and in terms of follow the leader. Some media outlets, international media outlets are following some international media leaders, some governments um, in the donor community are following um, leading governments. But if this is global leadership, and here I'm speaking about um, US foreign policy, then I think we're in real trouble. There was an excellent article published yesterday in the Washington Examiner by someone named John Bolton. And it reminded us that the early signs of the Biden administration are giving us no cause at the moment for a post-election victory lap for the administration. And that so far the administration has shown a propensity to, uh, as he says, throw US allies under a bus when it suits them. And this appears to be, in my view, what the US is doing to Ethiopia. It has chosen its side, it has chosen to side with a criminalized element of a particular party. It is now stuck with a mess that it has been partially responsible for creating. And although there's no shortage of articles and commentary at the moment, uh, the really interesting pieces which are starting to roll out uh, will be those that have undertaken deep research and longitudinal analysis on events over the last 12 months the results of possibly freedom of information requests put to governments, um, questions being asked about payments being made to media organizations, um, uh, questions being asked about the results of criminal investigations, of joint investigations, which are looking at human rights violations and atrocities. Uh, intelligence findings and the extent to which we may see intelligence communities at odds uh, or their analysis at odds with decisions that were taken by governments and, and political representatives. Um, and really just decent research which employs ethical, robust and rigorous methodologies and not lopsided sensationalized reporting. Okay, Professor Anna from Canada, thank you for your expertise and thank you for your precious time and thank you again for making time to give this interview via zoom from canada thank you very much bye-bye have a wonderful time you're welcome thank you for having me okay dear viewers this brings you the end of our edition for today have a wonderful time bye-bye